Hello, race fans. I'm Chris Durrell. I'm here with RotorPros.com to bring you my daily fantasy NASCAR breakdown of the Gander RV400 from Pocono Raceway. So what I'm going to do in this preview video is I want to look at some track history, a little bit of track type history, um, some current form, look at the last six races data on the sheet as well, and just kind of get some, some guys in our core that uh, we can have going into practice. Uh, practice one is on right now. Practice two, it would be in a couple hours here. Going to be going live with the show tomorrow. Um, this is a little bit different of a week again. It is a impound race, and that just means that uh, they're going to practice the first two practices today, and then later on this afternoon they're going to qualify. Those cars will be impounded. They won't be able to make any changes. And then inspection is going to start tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time. Should be wrapped up around 11, 11, 15 Eastern time uh, via Bob Pocker. So he's going to be reporting on that. I'm going to be following that in the Road of Pros members chat as well as going live tomorrow to discuss what's going to happen with the inspection. The last few inspections um, on these impound races haven't really been too, too impactful um, to drivers going to the rear and getting that new uh, starting position, but things could change here. Um, if you remember 2018, the one race, of, that would be the race where Kyle Busch, I believe, came from. Yeah, um, this race last year, Kyle Busch came from the 28th starting position. So you had drivers like Kevin Harvick, Kyle Busch, they both failed inspection. Then you had William Byron, Clint Boyer, Ryan Blaney, Austin Dillon, uh, Jimmy Johnson, Paul Menard. They all started, uh, Eric Almirola, they all started out. There's about 12 or 13 drivers that had to go to the back. So that can happen, um, but generally we're going to talk about some of the trends, and that isn't really the, the usual, and I think with this single car qual qualifying, um, the way they've really tightened up with some of these inspections and failing them and stuff like that. I don't think we're going to see a whole bunch of excitement, but either way, we're not going to have an official starting lineup until after that inspection. So like 11.15 to 11.30 a.m. Eastern, probably going to start the live show somewhere around 10.30 to 11. I kind of want to catch uh, somewhere in the middle of that uh, inspection because they do go by starting position. So whoever qualifies first, they're going to start with that car and move their way back. So we're going to have a good idea of what the starting half, uh, starting front half of the field is when I start the video. And then we'll, I'll just kind of go over and answer some questions and stuff like that um, as we go as to how we should build our course. So it's going to be a crazy morning tomorrow morning, so make sure to, to tune in with that. I'm going to uh, share the, I will share the link again on my Twitter at Jaeger underscore bombs nine, as well as in the Rotor Pros chat room. So this week, again, like I said, we're at Pocono Raceway for the second time this year. Two and a half mile tri-oval. Uh, we've got <clears throat> three very distinct different corners. Uh, turn 1 is 14 degrees, turn 2 is 8 degrees, and turn 3 is 6 degrees. Uh, very difficult to pass in some of these corners, so what they've actually done this week, it's going to make it a little bit different than the Pocono race we've seen earlier this year, is they've added some PJ1 compound to the track as well. Um, as you, if you're not familiar with that, it's just a compound they put down on the track. It's very black. You'll be able to see it like in practices or qualifying or during the race you're going to see that really dark spot on the track it's just to create more grip and more pass and see the problem with Pocono um, especially being a very aero dependent two and a half mile track is the cars get caught behind each other in their wake think of it like water behind a boat or whatever it's the same thing with air so um, say a car in second place comes up on the car in first place you can't pass them because you know following them you're not gaining any time with them because you're just in their wake and it's very hard to get outside that wake without losing ground to, to get a different line so what they're trying to do here is create some different lines so drivers can can get out of that wake and you know make more passes so that's what they're trying to create this week um, and looking at that in lane three or sorry where they've applied it is in turn one, they put it in lane three, so the outside lane, <clears throat> the most outside lane. In turn two, it's in the middle lane, and then on uh, turn three, it's up in that uh, high lane three there again. Whether they're going to lay any down again after qualifying today is yet to be seen, so stay tuned for that again in the live show as well. So lock for tomorrow, um, got over here on the side of the screen, we've got the practice times. Um, qualifying is 4, 4 p.m. Eastern today, inspection 9 a.m., and then lineup lock is 3 p.m. Eastern tomorrow afternoon. Um, so that's, you know, gives us a few hours if it's done at 11.15. We've got a, probably going to have about three, three and a half hours, so it's not going to be too bad to, to make lineups. I do suggest if there's some contests that you do like that do fill up fast, like the $4 Chrome Horn on DraftKings, 
is one that fills up fast. It's a 20 max entry. Um, a lot of the 3 max entries and stuff like that on either site, um, FanDuel as well with single entries, 3 entry maxes, 5 entry maxes, 10 entry maxes, all those max entry contests like that fill up fast. So I suggest going in and making a dummy lineup on FanDuel, reserving your spots. You can reserve them just outright on DraftKings. Be able to do that so you get in the contest that you really want to get into. So We've got uh, the last six race winners um, up top, but what we're going to do now is we're going to jump over to the cheat sheet and we're going to have a look at the last six races as well as some track history and stuff like that. Um, but if you're not a Roto Pros member yet, and you're watching this video, want to come in and see what we're about, definitely head over to rotopros.com. Um, we're, we're a really, we're a growing community. Um, I wouldn't say we're new, we're fairly new. Um, I've been on board for about a year now. We got the reboot with the rotopros.com. Um, the biggest thing that we really do, as you see here, is lineup coaching. And it's not just lineup coaching, it's one-on-one -on -one coaching where we really want to teach our customers um, how to research better, what to look for, what stats to look for. Um, we cover MLB, NHL, PGA, NBA, um, MLB. Uh, we've got MMA coming down the road. We've got a bunch of different stuff like that. But our Slack chat is really our number one where we help our customers with lineup selection, contest selection, um, when it comes to bankroll management, how to play cash games um, versus GPPs, how to construct your lineups, how to build player pools. So a lot of information that goes into it. Um, with our with our analysts over there at rotopros.com and you can go and get a free trial right now actually if you hit the gray sign up button up here in the top right hand corner of the screen we have weekly monthly and yearly subscriptions you're going to get a three day trial with the weekly uh, seven day trial with the monthly and yearly subscription that gives you a um, chance to come in and check out what we're all about so now let's jump in and talk some track history so right at the top, as you're going to see, um, Kyle Busch is right up there. And this column in the track history here is going back to the start of the 2017 season, so the last five races at Pocono. Kyle Busch has got three wins. He's actually got back-to-back -back wins, three of the last four, and f four top fives and five top tens in that time. He leads all drivers with 318 laps led. Kevin Harvick's the only one that's been even close in that department, 119. So that puts Kyle Busch way out in front in terms of fantasy scoring. Um, over the last, we've got last three and last five races up here. Last three just takes us back to 2018. Last five obviously takes us back to 2017. Just a little bit of a comparison there, just how the sheet was set up. So 82.5 DraftKings points, um, 67 FanDuel points over the last three races, and not much difference over the last five races, 79.8 DraftKings and 64.4 FanDuel. Right, let's go just go look at that race uh, last year. So we've got Kyle Busch starting from the second position, Brad Kozlowski from the fifth, Eric Jones from the fourth, then we've got Clint Boyer. So as you can see, the correlations here from starting position to finishing position are very strong, and that shows with our correlation 0.672. Um, seven drivers finished top 10 that started top 10. Now, the outlier here when looking at the last six races, when looking just specifically at this correlation um, row here is the outlier was that 2018 race here last year where everyone failed inspection where I said like 12 or 13 cars started outside the top 30 near the back of the field that's going to skew the numbers a bit that is an outlier so I'm not going to be too con looking at this a whole bunch but what does stand out about that race is that even though the correlation was low we had a lot of those drivers start outside the top 30 really good cars that got up front not necessarily up front, but picked up that double-digit place differential like you can see, is that still seven drivers finished top 10 that started top 10. So that's, that remained, even though we had all those good cars start from the back. They didn't exactly all make it back up front. Three of them finished top 10. You had William Byron, Kevin Harvick, and Kyle Busch. Um, they started just inside the top 30, but still, they started at the back because they failed inspection. The only three of those cars out of the 13 that did that made it inside the top 10. Three more here just outside the top 10, but um, it remained the same that starting up front is very important here just because of that passing. Now, that could change with the PJ1 this week um, a little bit, but I don't think it's going to change dramatically where we're all of a sudden going to see five, six drivers outside the top 20 um, all of a sudden race forward and be the strongest cars of the day. I think the cars that are going to start up front are going to be the strongest cars. Obviously, when they qualify, 
that's what they're going to be starting the race with because it's an uh, impound race. So keep that in mind as well. But I think the strongest cars that we're going to see are going to be the ones that are going to, for the most part, be up front, barring wrecks, mechanical failures, stuff like that. So sliding over a little bit more, again, we've got a high correlation, only five drivers in that top 10, um, five with double digit place differential, none led 100 laps. That's only happened once in the last six races where drivers led 100 plus, and not once in the last five races has there been more than one driver, like multiple drivers lead 50 plus laps. So not as much of a dominator race, but I think we do see one or two drivers um, this week get up there and lead at least 40 plus, maybe get into that 50 plus range as well. <clears throat> and again, it's gonna all depend on practice for, for those projections. Looking at the 2017 races. Sorry. Looking at the 2017 races here, same story, 0 0.630, 0 0.677 when looking at the correlation, 3 and 5 when looking at double-digit place differential. Um, we had one, only one driver here in those two races that started outside the top 20 and finished top 10, and seven um, top 10 starters finished top 10. So again, that correlation holds high. Same here, we had six double-digit place differential. It was down a little bit, uh, 0 0.420. Now, Keep in mind that this was Chris Buescher's win. This was a rain-shortened race. Um, it was kind of a strategy thing. They did end up blowing a tire, which kind of led to the strategy that they used to get out, to get that track position and get out front before the rain came. Um, so that was another outlier race when looking at the last six races here. So keep that in mind as well, um, that just some weird things happened. So that kind of contributed. But any of the normal races, and I say normal, um, where there was no rain or there was no wacky um, qualifying, of those races, the correlation has been high to start to finish. That's kind of what I wanted to look at and point out here. Um, Kyle Busch had 79 laps led. So he didn't even get to 100 laps led in a race where he started second, pretty much dominant. He had 50 um, fast laps and no one else. As you can see here, only two other drivers had more than 10. That's William Byron with 12 and Larson with 13. So he definitely had the best car last year. Um, kind of goes the same thing. He started from 28th. He had the best car when he failed inspection in the 2018 the second race in 2018 as well led 52 laps 31 fast laps um, same with Harvick they both had fast cars so that's something just to kind of look at going forward so let's go back to the track history here <clears throat> up next like I said is Kevin Harvick um, but I want to break down a little bit of the Joe Gibbs team um, just because they stand out. I'm watching them in practice. They make up four of the top seven spots in practice. So I talked about Kyle Busch and his dominance here. Hasn't always been that way for Busch. He struggled kind of here earlier in his career. Um, like I said, he's got back-to-back -back wins, three in the top four, or sorry, three wins in the last four races here and top tens in six straight. He's also led a ton of laps, um, 50 or more laps in four of the last five races here as well. So he's He's pretty much been the dominator. We heard about this last week. He started out strong, led a bunch of laps. He couldn't finish the deal. I think he's going to be right back up there again this week because the 18 team, all they're looking for now is to get up there and get those playoff points, which is going to be big to give them some cushion, especially with the playoffs um, with some wacky races in there like we seen last year. You're going to need those extra points just to give you that little bit of cushion. So that's going to be another narrative this week that I maybe didn't go over is watch the playoff bubble because there's going to be drivers that already have wins where they'll take the risk and they'll go for more wins to get those more playoff points. But you start looking at drivers, uh, 16 make the playoffs, so we've got six races to go. So here's kind of a look um, at 13th to 18th, which is very tight in the points right now. Um, these are drivers without wins that are fighting for points to get into the playoffs. So you've got Kyle Larson, 13th at 519 points. We've got Eric Jones, 516 points in 14th, Ryan Newman in 15th, 509, Clint Boyer at 505 on the bubble, Jimmy Johnson just below the bubble at 488, Daniel Suarez tied with him at 488, and then Paul Menard's kind of getting um, behind a little bit. He's going to need a lot of a lot of making up to do here. Um, he's 19th at 445. So those drivers like Jimmy Boyer, Newman, uh, Jones, Larson, even Byron in 12th at 549 points, those drivers um, might use some strategy and stay out you know, stay out at the end of uh, stage one and stage two to try and get more of those points um, for finishing inside the top 10 at the end of those stages versus some of the other drivers especially at, like at the end of stage two might pit before the pits are closed like with two laps to go before the end of the stage 
so that they can set themselves up more for the end of the race um, versus guys trying to get the most points as they possibly can. If they can get up front again near the end of the race, great. But if they don't, they want as many points as they can at the end of those stages. Um, so that kind of is going to correlate to the end game uh, of these races where some of those drivers are going to be fighting for points early on. They may not be the best DFS plays that day. We're going to have to pay attention to practice and see how things go, see some interviews. Um, I'm going to be watching the next practice, taking some notes and stuff as well, kind of going through uh, some some write-ups and, and some some interviews from guys, especially uh, Bob Parker does a really good job of uh, talking to the drivers throughout practice and after practice and stuff. So be looking at some reports there, just kind of see what drivers are saying. But that's something to keep in mind this week is those playoff standings. You can grab those over at NASCAR.com. goes through it really well. <clears throat> So back to track history, I want to look at the rest of uh, Kyle Busch's teammates here. Eric Jones stands out next. He comes in with back-to-back -to -back top fives. He's got top tens in four of his five career races here. Um, the only one wasn't was uh, 29th uh, in June of 2018 last year. He started top five in both of those last two races where he finished top five, so that's good to see that he, and he, you know, last week again he showed that he can start up front, has a strong car, and stay up front. He was very fast in this first practice that's going on uh, that I believe just wrapped up. So that's good to see as well that he's got a strong car. He's definitely going to be one of my um, pre-qualifying core plays for sure is Bush and Jones again. He's got to love his price at 8300 here as well. Um, pairing him with Bush I think makes a lot of sense there if you're doing some stacks. Danny Hamlin, um, he started his career when, when he was a rookie in the Cup Series back in way, way back in 2006. Back-to-back -back wins, he swept the two races here in 2006, started both those races from the pole, um, started his career, he went on with a 6th, 3rd, and 3rd after those two wins, and then he had a rough spell, 23rd and 38th in 2008 and 2009. He then won back-to-back -back races again. He's been up and down since, um, he hasn't had quite as much success, he hasn't won a race since um, those back-to-back -back races in 2009 and 2010, but he does come in with back-to-back -to -back top 10s, 6th place earlier this year, um, after starting sixth, and he finished tenth in the second race last year after starting second. So I will be looking at him. So he, he leads everyone with four career um, wins at the track. But like I said, there's some context in that those four races, it's been about nine years since his last race here. Jimmy Johnson leads, um, he's right behind him. Jimmy Johnson, we've got Kurt Busch, as well as Kyle Busch, are the other two drivers with three wins apiece. Jimmy Johnson's got 11 top 5s, 20 top 10s in his career here and leads all drivers with 740 laps led. Talked about Kyle Busch already. Kurt Busch, um, nice value. He's been strong here. Three wins in his career. And if we go back and just look at recent, he hasn't been as dominant. I, I don't want to say dominant, but he hasn't really shown that, that upside. His last win was 2016. Um, in the first race, and the other one before that was 2007. But he's been solid here, like his last six finishes here, 11th, 9th, 19th, 13th, 4th, 10th, and then that win in 2016. So he's been solid, so if he's got speed, he's definitely going to be someone we're going to want to consider in that mid-range, especially on DraftKings. <clears throat> I'd like him to maybe qualify around 10th, somewhere around there, but I still will consider him from the 5th to 10th starting position as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So moving on, uh, back to the Joe Gibbs racing, talked about Hamlin, finished it off with Martin Trex Jr. 35th earlier this year, uh, had an engine issue, a little bit of an outlier there for him. Uh, 15th in the second race last year, he won this race in, the, in, in June last year, and then he was 3rd and 6th in 2017, so he has had some success here too. Like I said, all four Joe Gibbs cars were inside the top seven in first practice. Looks like they've got some speed again. They're probably going to be, uh, as of right now, they are my top team to target um, at the moment. And then right behind them is going to be Stuart Haas, who got the first win last night, or last night, last week uh, with Kevin Harvick. So I'll definitely be looking at him again here this week as well as his teammates. Um, they showed some speed in first practice as well. You had Suarez top on the board, and that was near the end of practice where he jumped up, um, jumped over William Byron on the board. You've got Eric Almarola, who was third in that first practice. Clint Boyer was fifth. Uh, Harvick was down in 13th, uh, but overall the team had four drivers inside the top 13. You add the four Toyota drivers, that makes up eight of the top 13 of just those two teams. 
Um, the other outliers are William Byron, Jimmy Johnson, finishing second and sixth in the Chevys, the Hendrick Chevys. That takes care. And then he also, it was also impressive to see Matt DiBenedetto. He cracked the top ten right behind Kyle Busch and Denny Hamlin and Eric Jones as well. So that's another Toyota um, in there as well in first practice. So something to keep uh, in mind, something I'm looking at here as we, as we head into second practice and into qualifying a little bit later today. <coughs> So Suarez was fast. I just mentioned that. So just want to kind of look at uh, his numbers here. He shows up down just a little bit. Um, he's got one top five, three top tens in the last five races here. He's only led 39 laps. He's had good starting positions, so that's kind of hampered his uh, DraftKings scoring because on average he's losing about 1.2 points, uh, 1.2 positions in the last five races. But he's got back-to-back -back top tens. Um, eighth, second, and seventh. Those are his finishes in three of his last four races here. Um, started from ninth and first. So he started inside the top 10 in his last two races and finished top 10. So he's one of those drivers when we talked about seven drivers um, starting top 10 and staying there. So he has shown that he's had a good car, a consistent car throughout those races. So I'm definitely looking at him. He's a driver that needs a win. He is outside the bubble enough. I'm just going to just jump back to those standings here real quick and just kind of update that. <clears throat> Suarez currently sits, yeah, 18th, so he's tied with Jimmy, and they are 17 points behind. So it's it's definitely going to be risky if he's going to be starting. You know, if he's starting top 10, he's probably going to have a strong card. He's probably going to finish top 10. That's probably what their aim is, is to get top 10 points in all three stages. Um, so definitely be looking at him as, as a core driver this week. And then going back to Hendrick, uh, I'd definitely be looking at them. William Byron is in that situation as well. Same with his teammate, Jimmy Johnson. Byron's got a little bit more play with when it comes to points than Jimmy does. And he's finished 9th, 6th, and 18th in three career races here. Pretty impressive for a young driver at a at a, at a tougher track, perceived tougher track. Um, Jimmy Johnson just hasn't been the same. He's finished outside of 16th. He hasn't finished top 15. Um, he, he's only done that once in the last seven races. He just hasn't been as good here, hasn't shown as strong a car. It seems to be he's not making a lot of green flag passes this year. They have a ex they have they're having some excellent strategy on pit road and they're passing cars there. But as for passing cars in the track, it's just not happening yet. Uh, so I'm just not jumping totally on Jimmy yet, especially if he started in top ten. We more of a GPP play on FanDuel. If he starts outside the top ten this week, tenth to fifteenth, I'll start considering him a little bit more on DraftKings. <clears throat> then we'll just have a look at Alex Bowman here. We'll just continue on with the Hendrick Motorsports team. Sorry, I can't get a, a link to load here. Hasn't been great um, with BK Racing in 2014, 31st in both those races. Not really looking when he's with those smaller teams. He's 25th, 26th with Tommy Baldwin Racing the year after that in 2015. In 2018, um, he joined Hendrick Motorsports. He was 27th in his first race. Things look to be going uh, right about where it was without throughout his career. He turned that around with a third place finish in this race last year and then 15th earlier this year. So uh, it all depends on where he starts at 9300 His price is starting to get up there a little bit, but definitely looking at him. Ryan Blaney is going to be on my list this week. He got his first career win here at Pocono, um, and it was pretty impressive. That was back in 2017, the first race. It was pretty impressive because he passed, I believe he passed Kyle Busch late in the race and then held off um, Kevin Harvick as well near the end of the race for the, like the last two or three laps he held off Kevin Harvick so it was a pretty impressive win so I'll definitely be looking at that a little bit um, his qualifying hasn't been as good here as other drivers so he's been a little bit better in terms of fantasy scoring over the last five years on average but again qualifying is really going to matter when it comes down to that so I talked about a few drivers that stand out um, from a track history standpoint so what we're going to do next is we're just going to we're going to look at some current form. Um, we're going to talk about drivers that are maybe coming in hot over the last six, ten races. Uh, maybe ones that are trending up. And of course, you know we're going to have Matt Benedetto on this list. Unfortunately, he burnt me last week because I wasn't really buying into him starting seventh. But that's in the past. We'll move on. Um, he looks like he's got a strong car in this week. So don't just throw it out if he's starting top ten. You know we learn as we go on. Um, so let's learn from our lesson and uh, go on. So let's look at some drivers that are coming in hot right now, looking at current form. 
Um, so I'm just going to go, and if you're new to the sheet and you're making your own copy, you're looking to sort a column, just click in that column. So I want average finish, so I'm just going to click on any one of these columns. Data, sort A to Z, lowest to highest. There we go. So Kyle Busch and Ryan Newman both have 8.8 .8 average finishes over the last six races overall. Um, Kyle Busch has got three top fives, four top ten. So things have really spread out over the last... I believe it's seven races. We've had seven different winners over the last seven races. So the the form, as you can see, is very tight across the board. No drivers had multiple. Yeah, like I said, no drivers had multiple wins since Martin Truex Jr.'s run, where he won four, I think, four of six, four of seven races there, uh, mid season, kind of going into the start of summer. So Kyle Busch, Ryan Newman's been just absolutely solid. Five top tens in his last six races at eight thousand. We're definitely gonna have to consider him again. Um, as long as he's uh, like not starting on the pool or something silly like that and not showing top speed. But as of right now, he's definitely uh, going to be a top value play at 8,000 on both sites. Um, you know, looking at his track history over here, maybe hasn't been the greatest with just one top 10 in the last five races. 15.4 uh, average finish. So we're going to be looking for him to maybe qualify around that 15th to 20th position or outside of that for max value on him. But I think if he shows us some speed and practice like he's shown here recently, he's going to be a good value play. He hasn't been qualifying well at all lately. As you can see, the last six races, he's averaging a 22.3 starting position. So definitely um, in, definitely into that if he's starting outside the top 15. Outside the top 20 is even better this week. Kurt Busch, we talked about him. Uh, one of the drivers with three career wins here. He's actually got a win in his last six races, two top fives, three top tens. Average finish under uh, under 10 at 9.5, um, average rating 96.3. Because of his you know qualifying really good lately, like I think he leads all drivers in qualifying over the last six races. Yeah, tied with Joey Logano. That's hurt his fantasy scoring a little bit just because he's not a dominator driver. He's not going to pick up those laps led. So that tends to lean me more uh, with Kurt Busch when it comes to FanDuel. Just because he's not normally a guy that's going to be a dominator. Um, and that's more to FanDuel if he's starting inside the top five, obviously. If he's starting out the side of the top ten, I think there's some enough place differential uh, upside there to give you uh, those points to make up for the, the points that he's not going to get from, from not being a dominator. So keep that in mind. Martin Trex Jr., um, kind of the same story as Bush. He's got one extra top 10 on top of those wins. Hasn't qualified as well, so the scoring's been a little bit better. Not not a whole bunch. As you can see, pretty even on FanDuel because finishing positions, um, obviously a little bit more important. Um, but they're both a little bit less on FanDuel than Denny Hamlin, um, who's got three top fives in that time. He's the only other driver outside of Kyle Bush's teammate with three top fives in the last six races. Joey Logano has been solid. Um, his fantasy scoring has stayed up, even though his average finish is 11.3, simply because he's he leads everyone in those last six races in laps led. Right ahead of Kevin Harvick, who's got 200. They've both got a win. Um, <clears throat> so they've both shown, they both had strong cars. And you look at the average rating, which kind of looks at everything throughout the race, average running position, stuff like that, laps led. Um, and you got four drivers in the last six races who are above 100 even. So that's not always as important to look at just average finish. I like looking at average rating as well. So, you know, of the top tier guys, we've got Kevin Harvick, Joey Logano, Martin Truex Jr., and Kyle Busch. Surprise, surprise, who are the highest rated cars. Um, one that's kind of down, we've got Kurt Busch at 96.3, and then we're down down here at uh, Brad Keselowski as well. Chase Elliott way down here. So Chase, that tells me that there's maybe some regression coming. I talk about it in baseball, looking at regression stats, regression to the mean type stuff. When I see Chase Elliott, um, you know, a championship contending car and a championship contending team, way down here in 28th position in average finish over the last six races, but having a rough go of it. But he is, you know, when you look at average rating, you know, if you go and you sort by that, he jumps way up the board here um, to 14th. So he's maybe been running better than where his finishes have been at. I think he may be, you know, a good GPP play just because of that, because of his current form. I think a lot of people will maybe steer clear of him, provided he doesn't qualify like 25th and have a top 10 speed car in both practices type thing. But um, just looking at it right now, he looks, if people are just looking at current form, uh, looking at box scores, definitely recency bias. They're probably going to be a little bit lower owned on Chase Elliott. So 
that's a direction I will definitely uh, be targeting, provided, you know, qualifying and stuff like that. Um, I will be looking at in GPP formats there. And then other drivers who stand out maybe um, from a value perspective, William Byron, 7,100, been running good. He's finished inside the top 20. And as you can see, there's only five drivers who have finished inside the top 20 in each of those last six races. He happens to be one of them, um, the cheapest of them as well. Um, so that's really good there. And then the other driver that stands out, and we just kind of look at both of them, um, going down here is Busher. Chris Busher has been... Him and Ryan Newman have been the top value plays pretty much all season. They've been consistent. Uh, Byron's trending down a little bit coming in. Like after he had back-to-back -back ninth place finishes at Charlotte and Pocono, um, and then 18th, 19th at Michigan and Sonoma. Then he jumped back up back-to-back -to -back top 10s at Chicago and Daytona, but then back to 18th and 12th at Kentucky and Loudoun. So he's been... He's been very up and down, and he's a young driver, so that's going to happen. Um, so he could be a little bit lower owned this week as well. Um, someone I'm maybe looking at um, adding to my GPP player pool. And uh, again, it's going to depend where they qualify. If he qualifies 25th, I'm probably going to look at him in cash games as well. Chris Buescher, like I said, has been one of the most consistent drivers. It's just been unreal. Um, since a 23rd place finish at Dover, uh, that would be nine races ago. These are his finishes in the Cup Series. And remember, he is not in a top car. That, 30, that 37 car is is not one of the top cars that should be up there running with, uh, you know, Joe Gibbs and, and looking at Hendrick and looking at Stuart Haas Racing and Penske. Shouldn't be up there running with those cars, uh, Roush, Fenway, but they are. He's been very solid. They're, they've got their program coming along very well. So since that 23rd finish, he's gone. 10th, 6th, 14th, 16th, 16th, 18th, 17th, 10th, 25th. Those are all, his best starting position during that whole time was at Sonoma where he started 10th and finished 16th. Other than that, he started 18th, 22nd, 24th, 31st, 27th, 22nd, 25th, and 25th. So he's picking up place differential um, by the bunches. Race after race after race after race in that mid-7K range, um, finishing with 10th to 20th place finishes consistently. He's just been a consistent value play. It's him and Newman are two drivers that I almost plug into my cash games before um, I even go anywhere else. And I know that they're going to be high owned because of their consistency. But um, So that's why I like them a little bit more for cash games. I will have exposure, but I'm probably going to be underweight on those guys. Something I'm learning a little bit in um, GPPs is if I feel they're going to be 40% owned, you know, more, more times than not, you're going to want more exposure to that guy if you're really buying in. But if you're not completely bought in on someone, um, but you still want exposure to two guys who've been consistent all year, like you compare them together, gives you a lot of salary relief to kind of go where you want um, when doing lineup construction, is those guys that are going to be high-owned that aren't elite drivers, that aren't in that elite tier like the Kyle Busch, I'm not worried about if he's going to be 60% owned or 40 to 60% owned. I'm not worried about Martin Trex Jr. or Brad Kozlowski if he or Kevin Harvick if he's going to be because um, those are championship drivers um, that have you know strong teams behind them. But when you get these guys like Ryan Newman, Chris Buescher, who've been yes they've been good, but they're not in top equipment. I'm going to say um, this is probably the best way to put it. Drivers that aren't in top equipment that are going to be 40, 50% owned. That's when I'll start making some pivots in GPP to guys that are half or even less than half or more than half owned um, to try and make some pivots there because this is a very high variant sport. And if you can make those pivots, Ryan Newman or Busher gets in trouble, you've just eliminated 40, 50, whatever their ownership happens to be. You eliminate those people from the contest. Um, the, all those lineups with those drivers or one of them or whoever gets in the crash of both do, you're way ahead of the game. Um, so that's just kind of the way I look at GPP lineup construction, but definitely for cash games, those two are, are easy ones to plug in right away and just kind of move along with your lineup. You can build a really balanced lineup starting with those two. So I looked at um, I looked at track history, I looked at current form, broke down the track a little bit. If you've got any questions um, throughout practices, throughout qualifying, definitely hit me up in the Roto Pros chat. We have um, NASCAR talk open. It is a new channel that I've opened up. We've got NASCAR news, so you can kind of follow along with um, updates from Bob Pockers and others from NASCAR. Um, they're at the track. They're on the ground. They're getting the information. They're giving us all the information, whether it be interviews, 
whether it be just small things that happened in practice, um, no matter what it is, there's tons of information in there. And then we can talk about it in the NASCAR talk. This is where I share tons of stats throughout the week, um, this track history stuff, stuff, um, stuff concerning like uh, whenever Bob posts, I got it up here that uh, the practices are Saturday qualifying um, and then impound race, tech starts at nine. Just get all my information. I'd like to share it with you guys in the NASCAR talk channel. Um, or you can hit me up on Twitter at Jaeger underscore bombs nine. And make sure to check back on the sheet. Um, this is the sheet that's available to everyone. The members only sheet will be coming out after qualifying. I'll have my picks on there. Um, I'll have some practice notes on that sheet as well for the members only. And like I said before, if you're not a member, get over to rotopros.com. Get your free trial. Come in, see what we're all about. Pretty sure you're going to be satisfied and stick around. Um, but yeah, grab that members only copy in the chat after qualifying and I will be updating pr uh, practice one once this video is over and then practice two starts uh, right away here in about 20-25 minutes. Um, to this time obviously the video needs some upload time so it's going to be a little bit after. Practice two is probably going to be over by the time you get the video out so I will throw out some updates. The sheet will be updated. I'll include the link um, to this sheet in the YouTube video below as well as in the members chat. Thanks for joining me. Let's go out there this week. Um, let's build a player pool. That's kind of the, the key of looking at things before qualifying happens is to build your player pool and then analyze it and go back and look at it um, once practice and qualifying is over. Let's get this um, let's get this going. Let's get the research going. Um, getting to do the same things every week, getting in a rhythm is the way that we're going to be successful, not completely changing the way you go about lineup construction just because of one week. Um, so that's kind of a key lesson for today is to not look at last week and say, okay, I, I did this wrong, or I didn't win last week, so I'm going to change the way I go about constructing my lineups now. Um, go back and look at the winner's lineup. Go back and look at all the lineups from the top ten. Compare it to yours. What did they do different? Obviously, um, the, the biggest thing, and I mentioned already last week, was De Benedetto fading him, who you know finished top ten, had big points at a cheap price, versus other guys that we went like Ryan Priest was one. So that was kind of the mistake last week. Um, so I'm not gonna, what I've learned is I'm not going to overlook drivers who are maybe trending up, who are showing a strong car throughout the whole weekend and are starting close to up front. I'm not going to fade them just because of that. It's not like a Daniel Hemrick situation like we've seen on some of these aero tracks where him and Austin Dillon have qualified really, really well but haven't been able to put a race together yet. Um, and have lost a lot of uh, fantasy points because of that. It was a different situation than that completely. So the key is look back, always learn. If you're not learning something each and every day, each and every race, each and every week, each and every slate, you're behind your competition. Let's go get them, Roller Pros. Good luck out there.